Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. You know, pecan trees are one of our favorites for homegrown nuts that fill many a pie. But like every tree this year, they're under stress. Today, Lisa Berdahl from Berdahl Pecan Farms explains how to keep your trees healthy, why some years are better than others, and what varieties to plant. On tour, visit a hillside terrace for fruit, vegetables, and flowers. On this once forbidding slope, now a garden gracefully directs water to terraces of fruits, vegetables, herbs, and ornamentals. We grew up in New Hampshire in a rural area, and um, there was always stuff to eat around. Apples were huge, um, grapes were huge. In their new Austin garden, Suzanne and John Shore wanted it all flowers, wildlife, and food. When he was in medical school too, we canned the first two years we had a community garden. And uh, so we would trade, uh, we had lots of potatoes, just lots of veg vegetables. To fill their kitchen with varieties geared for Central Texas, especially on unwelcoming terrain, the Shores got help from designer Rosemary Vincent and her son, landscape architect Kellen Vincent. I think it's a, a really interesting combination. You know, everybody wants some excitement. And from what we're trying to do here and tried to do with John and Suzanne was to, to at least give them color and something fruiting or flowering, you know, year round almost. Not only do you have the color, but you have the fragrance. Of course, you have the fruit, and you know, that's exciting too, and the vegetables. We believe that, you know, when you come into a landscape, you need to have something to do. Something's going on, something, something exciting to look at. But first, the slope and its drainage problems demanded attention. I was looking at it and, then, and saying, you know, what if, what if we could kind of terrace it? We started researching, you know, how much it would take to build stone steps and retaining walls like you normally would in a uh, historical piece. Although Kellen wanted to reflect the Tuscany style of the home's architecture, he also favored a design to connect its Austin roots. Plus, since restrictions on impervious cover negated stone, he found his solution with grassy steps retained by steel. Everything that's being used as retainage structure is actually quarter inch steel, so then you didn't have the footprint that you would for stones. His design collects, diverts, and allows percolation of rainwater back into the soil, fending off erosion. Visually, he and Rosemary also wanted to soften and contrast the linearity. Historically, uh, villa gardens are axial, so they're, they're symmetrical on both sides. Based on the character of the house, they didn't want to go a full classical historical villa garden, and plus they're used a lot. So we took that general symmetry, kept that, but we wanted some more contemporary shapes. I think that, that the curvature and the different shapes and how they work together gives you kind of a flow. And the way that the garden is laid out and you can walk around uh, any time of the day. I like to come out in the morning when the sun's just coming up and bring a cup of coffee out. And we have several different places where you can just sit and, and listen to the birds. They're singing like mad and eating our berries. Perhaps scaring them all. <laughs> so, uh, it, but, you know, and then in the evening we'll come out in the evening and, and kind of work in the garden a little bit after I get home from work. And, and so it's, it's, that's very peaceful. It's very quiet. There's not a lot of the noise around here, not a lot of traffic, and that's also really, really nice. We want a Texas feeling to it, uh, not wild altogether, but controlled wild, if that makes any sense to you. And we're informal people, uh, so this, this just works for us. We wanted color. You know, we wanted a mixture so that we could have colors, and I was surprised last summer, which was our first summer to really have it, um, how much color there was here, even in the hottest part of the summer. I mean, mm -hmm. it just went all the way through, and that really surprised me. And in the fall, the whole top part turns bright red, and then the, there's a the yellow below it. I mean, it's so colorful, it's beautiful. It's hard to believe it's so thick and rich and colorful in the fall. Knockout roses plume a sitting area, shared with the lavender that Suzanne loves. We used to have this, I would uh, let it dry in the fall, and you bundle it with a really pretty satin ribbon and give those to friends, and I just love doing that. That's so much fun. Thanks to water and plant biodiversity, the gardens restored wildlife diversity too. 
I think one of the things that really surprised me last summer, because I happened to be out here sitting, Suzanne was away for the weekend and I was just kind of out here by myself and I was fascinated because we had about five hummingbirds. Oh, yeah. And the hummingbirds, you could just see them, you know, going crazy and they'd hop from one thing to the yeah, next they and they'd come back. And, and uh, it, that was really, that was really kind of neat. I mean, I've seen hummingbirds before, but I'd never seen them that active and stay around that long. And, and so that was, uh, I enjoyed watching them. In front, Rosemary and Kellen gently framed the woods to ramble and reflect. John saw its natural poetry as a transition of space and mind to bridge intensive responsibilities and leave them by the wayside before the homeward step. That actually was the first thing I asked uh, Rose yeah. Kellen about was, you know, is there some way that we can draw that in so you can walk down and then see the garden before you get to the garden. It's engineered so that uh, it draws you into the garden. I come out for 15 minutes, you know, and I look at my watch and go, oh no, it's an hour, you know, I'm already late for the rest of the day. At least for a bit, the rush of their world slows down. So after you've been, you know, three miles away in downtown Austin, to be able to come to this and, and just have this privacy and quiet and yes. solitude, Unexpected. It's, it's, it's really nice. It's very, very restful. Oh, that's a spectacular garden. A little bit of Italy right here in Central Texas. Well, coming and speaking about Central Texas, we're going to be talking about one of our favorite plants, the pecan. And joining me to talk about pecan trees and a family pecan business is Lisa Berdahl from uh, Berdahl Pecan Farm, and it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank thanks for, you. Thanks for being here. Pecan, uh, the uh, Berdahl Pecan Farm out uh, off of Highway 71 between uh, Austin and Bastrop. It's been around as a family business for a long time. It's been 30 years, right? It has. My husband, Hal, and I planted our first orchard 30 years ago, and it was about 5,500 pecan trees. Just a few. <laughs> Just a few, exactly. Out in that beautiful bottom land there. It is. It's a uh, river bottom land, which is the best soil that you can plant pecan trees right. in. Right. That's where you see them growing native, and uh, you, you just follow Mother Nature's cue out there. And it has it is blossomed and grown into a, a full-blown enterprise. And so you, people can, let's talk about the, the variety of things that uh, you, you provide out there. Of course, the pecans themselves, and people can come out and can they actually harvest themselves? We don't let people come and harvest okay. pecans because of the machinery that's involved. Uh, sure. And it's a pretty busy place when okay. all that's going on. Oh, yeah. But well, they're more than welcome to drive through the orchards, mm -hmm. which we have expanded mm -hmm. to where we have about 15,000 pecan trees that are growing and that we harvest nuts right. off of. Well, it's a little different. For, I remember when I was a little boy growing up in upstate New York and going to pick the apple orchard, uh, the apples from the orchard. But... Uh, when you go to the pecan farm, those are pretty high limbs. You don't want to get out of there. <laughs> exactly. That's why we don't let people come you, in. It can be dangerous. <laughs> you don't want them beating up on the trees with poles right. either, which exactly. you see in the parks often. Now, there is a gift shop out there, and uh, you sell trees and a whole variety of pecan-related items, right? Right. What started out as just a small little retail store has blossomed into gifts, chocolate-covered pecans, pecan pies this year, pumpkin pies, and, of course, shelled and cracked and in-shell pecans. Okay, so the, a whole variety of things. And this is of great interest to our viewers right now because everybody's interested in food that can be grown and produced locally, including in their own backyards. And people are just very interested in things that are distinctly Texan and doesn't get a whole lot more Texan than a pecan, right? Exactly. It is the native tree. Right. Native and uh, one of the emblematic trees, really, for our area, really, when you think about it. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about how things have fared in, in this hot, dry weather with pecans. And I think you're out heading out towards Bastrop. Everybody thinks about the fires and the drought. How have you all done? It's been a challenging year. We changed all of our irrigation systems over to a drip mm -hmm. system 
to conserve water. Sure. We had an underground system which we feel like did a better job of watering all the roots and mm -hmm. all of the land, but we feel like we need to be conserving water right now. Well, we all need to be conserving water, so you're ahead of the curve a little bit on that one. And uh, the, the trees have fared well. The trees are fine. Mm -hmm. um, if we saw this for 10 more years, they can suffer. Mm -hmm. As you know, if the water wells go down, I mean, we're, we could anticipate more problems, but right now they're fine. Right. So uh, people can count on coming out and getting the pecans for sure. And when they're out there too, uh, they, can, they can actually purchase trees, correct? Exactly. We have trees for sale and people are still buying them and planting them even though it is so dry. Yeah. What's the, what's the best way uh, to, to plant pecans? Now one thing that, that's really different about pecans than say your typical tree is they are tap-rooted plants. Uh, so that makes for a pretty impressive root. Uh, you gotta be prepared to dig a little bit of a deeper hole, right? Exactly, all of our trees are container grown trees, mm -hmm. which make the trees a lot more healthier than a bare root tree. Sure. You don't have to cut the tops off of them, so that's a real benefit. Mm -hmm. And the holes do need to be dug about two and a half feet deep. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have <laughs> proper, good soil right. where you can dig a hole mm -hmm. that deep. We really encourage people to not plant mm -hmm. pecan trees if they don't have the proper soil to grow them correctly. So if you're in Caliche and you take your, your, your spade and you hit rock within an inch of the surface, probably not the best place for a pecan tree. Exactly. Now right. we'll have people that are very, they just want a pecan tree so bad, but mm -hmm. we really encourage them to not plant those. Right, but uh, there are plenty of places in our region where people can, and, and I know in my, my last backyard, we had nothing but deep clay as far as you could dig. Just be prepared, two and a half feet deep is pretty deep for a lot of folks. So, it is, yeah. it is. But uh, what are the, in terms of varieties of pecans, what do you like to recommend to people for this region? The varieties that we like are Pawnee and Choctaw. Mm -hmm. The Pawnee is the fastest growing variety in five years under good standards, good water conditions, fertilized conditions. You can get some pecans in four to five years. That's terrific, Pawnee. It, Pawnee, right. and it grows really well here. It's paper shell, thin mm -hmm. shell. Mm -hmm. Choctaw is also another favorite that has been around a long time. People are a little more familiar with that name. Mm -hmm. It has the same characteristics as the Pawnee. It takes a little longer to come in production, but those are the t best varieties for this area. Okay, and so those Indian name varieties, people will see lots of them, but the ones they should remember are the Choctaw and the Pawnee. Yes. Okay, and um, you know, one of the advantages that you get with these two varieties, I understand, is that they're disease resistant. And that's something that people need to be aware of, right? Exactly. A lot of varieties that people have heard of from other places, if you were to plant them here, you would have trouble with diseases and you would have to spray them and it's a lot of maintenance. So that's why we recommend the Pawnee and the Choctaw. Yeah. Well, even though they're native, and this is one thing that I, I remember early on in my career hosting a radio program, I, people would have asked questions about pecans, so I got in touch with the extension agents and said, could you please send me you know, a detailed list of all the things you recommend for pecan care? And it went on for page after page after page of recommended spraying schedules, this, that, and the other. So if, if you make the wrong choice, you could get into a big management issue. Exactly. We have a variety that we have that's Wichita is the mm. name of it. We love it, but the neighbor next door does not like it because they're on, we're on a totally mm. different spray schedule mm -hmm. and it will not work for somebody that doesn't manage their spray You're right. at the right times. And you know, and when one of the manifestations of uh, the diseases often is you get the, the fruit falling from the tree, the nuts falling from the tree early. Is that and there's that scab disease or some other kind of disease that causes that? Scab is a humidity issue. Mm -hmm. 
Wish so, we had that this year. <laughs> on a wet year, those are really hard to to grow. Right. On a dry year, not they so do <laughs> really well, which is so nice. This year, this not year. so bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. But but uh, what are some of the issues that, that do cause? You know, people we get questions all the time about. Why are my pecans falling in the middle of the summer or something like that? Normally they're going to fall because they're in stress. Mm -hmm. Be that water, fertilize, zinc spray is really important. Mm -hmm. um, it's very basic, really. Right. Um, but people think they're going to plant a tree and just leave it alone. Right. And they, we always say you get out of it what you put into it. Well, and that's wise words for any gardener. Now, Lisa, we just have a few moments left, so I want to make sure that people understand exactly where you're located again. So why don't you tell me uh, uh, how you describe folks how to find Berdahl Pecan Farm. We're located 10 miles east of the Austin Airport on Highway 71. You can't miss the retail store. It has a huge squirrel they just added. So <laughs> okay. look for the squirrel with the pecan in its mouth. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, for the squirrely out there in Central Texas, I'm sure that would be easy to spot. And we thank you so much for being a part of the program. And congratulations on uh, uh, basically a family-owned business now, 30 years going strong, attracting people from all over the state of Texas. It's great to have you on the program. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. All right. And coming up next is our friend Daphne. Hi, and welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Daphne Richards. This week's question comes from Diane. She has a firecracker fern in a pot, and it's covered with some sort of vine with tiny white flowers. She wondered if this were part of the plant or something she should be worried about. Well, it's definitely not part of the plant, and it is something to be worried about, but really not too much. The stringy, spaghetti-looking mess covering her beautiful firecracker fern is actually a parasite plant called daughter. Daughter invades the tissue of the host plant and steals its nutrients to grow. It has very little chlorophyll, so it's usually not green. It can range in color, though, from pale whitish brown to bright orange, even. And when you first see it, you'll wonder if someone hasn't covered your plants in silly string. This plant does flower and produces a prolific number of seeds, so you should remove it immediately and throw it away before those seeds have a chance to spread. Once you have seen the plant, keep an eye out for it around your yard and pull out fresh seedlings as soon as you see them growing on any of your plants. In this situation, I would suggest first removing all of the daughter from the container and also remove any plant parts that the daughter's attached to. Those have already been invaded and daughter will grow back from them. If you notice that the daughter grows back, I would suggest going ahead and tossing the whole container and getting a new firecracker fern, unfortunately. There's no recommended chemical control for daughter in this situation, so don't use any herbicides or fungicides. Although the plant seems like an alien from outer space, it's actually pretty easy to control with good cultural practices, ripping it up and tossing it out. I bet this one came in with the plant when it was originally purchased. But as long as you get rid of the parasite before the seeds spread around, there shouldn't be any future flare-ups. This week's plant is our native Texas poinsettia, Euphorbia cyathophora. It's also known as fire on the mountain. This small spreading plant does indeed resemble its showier relative, the Christmas poinsettia, with those striking reddish-orange colored bracts beneath the much less showy small ripe flowers. This plant generally stays 18 to 24 inches tall, but can get taller, especially if it's planted in deep shade because it will be stretching for more light. I was truly amazed by these native poinsettias in our demonstration garden during this summer's record-breaking heat and drought. With only one irrigation per week, the plants look fabulous all summer long. They did get a little wilty in the afternoon, but were always perked up by morning. Wild poinsettias are not picky about their soil type or their pH, so they should do well in most any central Texas landscape, from heavy clay to rocky limestone. Although they're listed for full sun, I've found that they're pretty happy in bright filtered light. They'll also spread at least a foot wide after you've planted them, so don't put them too close together. They flower from late summer through fall, and they're annuals, so they will come back in your garden next year from seed. The leaves have an interesting pointy shape, and the orange coloring on the bracts look like arrows, pointing out to insect pollinators just exactly where those inconspicuous little flowers are. As with most natives, fertilizer is not required and generally not recommended. Native poinsettias spread by seeds and by clumping, but they really aren't invasive in the landscape. A few people have remarked to me that they decided they didn't want it anymore, but it still came back even after they pulled it out. So be careful where you put it. 
but be assured that it will come back year after year in even the worst conditions. It's listed as hardy to zone 4, which is negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit, so it also won't have any trouble surviving our winters and actually may be perennial for us even though it's listed as an annual on the tag. To do in your garden this week, if you're planning for a winter vegetable garden, it's time to plant carrots, chard, and turnips. And also a great time to plant some cool season herbs like borage, fennel, parsley, and chamomile. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions or plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. Trees are an important part of our landscape and we can definitely uh, damage them by not maintaining them properly. Pruning too late or pruning too much is one of the ways that people kill their trees. I think training trees is like bringing up pets and children. You want to train them properly when they're small and do corrective measures when they're small so they'll grow up properly. And if the right tree is used in the right place, really little pruning should be needed. But it's best to do corrective work early in the tree's life to avoid making large cuts later on. If that tree branch is going to be hitting you in the head every time you mow, Cut it when it's an inch in diameter. Don't wait till it's four inches in diameter to make a large cut. You also don't want to make cuts flush with the trunk. You need to know how to do pruning correctly before you ever get the saw out. So do some studying and find that out. A proper cut will allow the branch collar to grow over the cut and completely heal. Wounds that don't heal will tend to shorten the life of the tree and can develop large cavities. Cut damaged or rubbing limbs promptly and uh, never top your trees. Now watering too much or watering not enough will also kill a tree. New trees need water two to three times a week in the hot summer months and if there's no rain they need it weekly during the rest of the year. You can use small sprinklers and just water with a low water height, about 18 inches tall at the most. Start with an hour of watering and then measure the soil moisture five inches deep 24 hours later. Use a long trowel to dig and inspect the soil moisture level. If it's still dry, increase the watering time next time you water. Soaking wet, cut back on the watering time. Enough water for the lawn around a tree is seldom enough for the tree's needs. Now tree bags like this one can help to water new trees. This one will uh, go around a six inch diameter tree, so it's ideal for smaller trees that you're growing. And uh, the water drips out slowly over six to eight hours. This one will hold 15 gallons and you uh, put the water in at the red spigot and then it drips out through the emitters. But you could also take five gallon buckets and just drill tiny holes in them to allow the water to drip out and put the water around different places in the root zone. The ideal location for watering is midway between the outside drip line and the trunk of the tree. You don't want to do a lot of watering really close to the tree. Now another thing that really hurts trees is allowing grass to grow up to the base of the tree. One of the biggest problems is that it causes weed eateritis. People will uh, use their weed eater right up to the trunk of the tree and that damages the uh, bark on the tree. And the grass also competes with trees for moisture and nutrients. It's especially important for fruit trees, young trees, and soft trunk trees like crepe myrtles. You can install raised beds around the trunks of trees and kill your trees also. Most of the roots for trees are in the top 12 to 18 inches. The increased moisture, compaction, and lack of airflow will decay the trunk and kill the tree. It may take several years for the damage to appear, so no one ever thinks the raised bed actually caused the damage. Build a raised bed and plant a tree in it so that it'll be at the proper height, but don't raise the soil height more than two inches around an existing tree. Now using the shade of your trees for a parking area compacts the soil and reduces water flow. Again, it may be years before you see the damage, but you can definitely kill your trees by parking under them. Letting vines like Asian jasmine and English ivy grow up to the trunk of the tree and into the canopy keeps moisture around the trunk and the roots actually grow into the bark with English ivy. Cut the ivy first, allow it to dry well before you pull it off to avoid removing much of the bark. Asian jasmine can girdle a tree and cut off nutrient flow, so keep these plants 15 to 24 inches from around your tree trunks. Also, get rid of girdling roots on your trees. These can kill a tree slowly by restricting nutrient flow and avoiding buying trees that have girdled roots. And then mulching is very important. Don't mulch too much and uh, don't uh, leave the mulch off. 
we'd ideally leave their leaves to provide nutrients for trees, but mulch can uh, help to hold moisture. Don't let it pack tightly, stir it up occasionally so water can flow through, but avoid volcano mulching. You'll see that and that can really damage the tree. So with these tips, you'll be able to keep your trees alive in the garden. I'm Trisha Shari for Backyard Basics. Thanks for joining us. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online and get more tips. Next week, author Sharon Lovejoy shows us how to spark childhood imagination with outdoor adventures. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org ctg.